flood out. Good morning, everyone. Welcome back to Pathophysiology. Hope you're all doing well and staying safe in uh, light of all the weather that uh, we had yesterday and we are anticipating having today. So before we get going, are there any questions? Do you have any questions? Okay, good. All right, good. Well, in that case, we will uh, get going. So today we have a, a nice full agenda of topics that I'd like to get through. I'm going to talk a little bit about um, a little bit about hematology and uh, microbiology and infections, and then a little bit about uh, sepsis, septic shock, severe sepsis, SERS, MODs, et cetera. And that uh, is, those will be the major concepts I want to get through today. Uh, so I think what we'll do is we'll just start talking a little bit about cells. This may seem a little bit out of, out of place, but I want to make sure that everybody is okay on just some basic definitions before we start talking about hematology and some of the pathology surrounding various uh, diseases. Let me just get logged in here through the iPad. There it is. There we go. Okay, so when we talk about what a cell is, make sure you can see that first. There we go. Up where we left off yesterday. All the necrosis stuff. So let me just draw a line here. There we go. All right. So when we talk about cells, a cell is generally considered the uh, basic unit of life in biology. Uh, what exactly is life? The definition of life is um, a bit contentious, and we won't really dive into it in any significant detail on this course because it is actually a very complicated question, and it's not fully answered at this point in time. Life is just kind of one of those things that if you see it, you kind of know it, <laughs> at least uh, for our purposes. So whatever the basic unit of life is, so some some simple unit that is able to undergo metabolism. It is uh, uh, able to reproduce itself. Um, it is able to take stuff from the environment, put stuff out as waste. It is able to maintain an internal environment that's separated from the external environment. All the, the various examples of things that we can say that life does, whatever that is, um, the basic unit is generally considered cell. all right? And there are two different types of cells that we are that are relevant for our purposes. There are what are known as prokaryotic cells. And there are what we call eukaryotic cells. And they are different in several ways. Prokaryotic cells are often defined as kind of older. They've been around for a lot longer, presumably. And some people will say that they are simple. And to some extent that's true, but because uh, they are a bit more stripped down, a bit more simple in some ways, they're actually able to do a lot of things that eukaryotic cells either have great difficulty doing or just cannot do. Prokaryotic cells can make energy in very different ways. Prokaryotic cells are capable of living, reproducing, and thriving in very extreme environments where eukaryotic cells uh, generally do not. And so um, it is true that eukaryotic cells are newer. They've been around they haven't been around as long um, and they are more complex. 
So there's more complex biochemistry, more complex molecular systems, generally speaking, uh, within eukaryotic cells. Uh, but that's not to say that they are necessarily worse than prokaryotic cells. Um, so let's just talk about some other uh, differences between these. Uh, the eukaryotic cells, one of the main things that we see with them is that they have a distinct nucleus. They have a distinct nucleus that is membrane bound. Whereas prokaryotic cells do not have a distinct nucleus. They have something called a nucleoid where the nuclear material, the, the DNA, um, is just kind of in this clump within the um, prokaryotic cell. So they do not have a well-defined nucleus and it's certainly not membrane bound and wrapped up and protected um, like we see with eukaryotic cells. So this allows, uh, because they're a bit more loosey goosey with their genetic material, so to speak, this allows them to mutate and this allows them to adapt uh, to environmental changes much faster than eukaryotic cells. They're able to divide much faster. In fact, cell division is very different from prokaryotic cells. They divide in something called binary fission. Whereas eukaryotic cells go through a very complex cell division process known as mitosis. And then there is a special type of cell division that occurs with just sex cells. So when we are producing sex cells, there's a very special kind of division that occurs where you're copying, you're just copying one, you're making one copy of the chromosomes and that's called meiosis with an E instead of an I. Meiosis with an I, it refers to uh, the pupils, pupillary constriction. This is meiosis with an E, which is a type of cell division that is specific to the sex cells where you have one copy of genetic material, as opposed to mitosis where one cell copies all of its genetic material and divides itself into two identical, or what we call daughter cells in a very um, complex process that we may talk about here in a little bit. Um, another thing is that prokaryotic cells can swap um, genetic material and, they, and and this is often due to a process known as plasma conjugation. Um, and a plasmid is kind of kind of like a, a gene or a chromosome sort of it's 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 basically a a, a clump of genetic material surrounded um, by a membrane. And it can, and when these prokaryotic cells die, or sometimes these prokaryotic cells can bump into each other and they can exchange, they can swap their plasmids, right? Um, and so it would be like two human beings bumping into each other and sharing genetic material. Like, let's say I have a trait, um, maybe I have a trait that um, protects me from heart disease better than most people. I have a gene you know, and, and somebody doesn't, I could bump into them and I could transfer that gene into them. Um, that is not something that is possible with eu eukaryotic organisms um, like us, right? In order for us to transfer genes, we have to reproduce, right? A biological male, biological female, they have to scramble their DNA essentially, right? And, and the, the sex cells combine um, an egg and a spermatozoa come together, each with a, a copy of genetic material comes together, scrambles it up and, and you have a new copy of genetic material. And that's how our genes get transferred. And um, there are different types of what we call gene transfer. Um, and when, when, when there is what's known as horizontal gene transfer, right? That is the transfer of genes between organisms in the same generation, right? That's something that prokaryotic cells can do very well. Whereas 
with organisms like us, eukaryotic based organisms, the only way that we can transfer genetic material is through, right, through different generations. So here you have generation A, for example, generation A reproduces and produce generation B and so on and so forth, right? Um, so you are not able to, we're not able to undergo horizontal gene transfer like uh, prokaryotic cells. Um, and so like if the human being, you know, a generation is approximately 20 years with a human being, right? Give or take, right? So when you talk about, um, like a generation X, for example, which is the generation I'm a part of, you know, these are people that born in, oh, approximately 1960 to 1980, right, right in there, right? And then after Gen X, you have the millennials, which were approximately 1980, to 2000 and then you have gen z i believe is what what the newer generation and that's like 2000 to 2020 and then prior to gen x you had the uh the so-called baby boomers right uh, so nine uh 1940 to 1960 roughly speaking, right? So it's approximately 20 years for generation of human being. And I, I, you know what I find interesting in, in all of the uh, political debate surrounding the quote unquote generations is everybody complains about millennials and how millennials are destroying the country um, and how these millennial high school students sound like, you understand millennials are like 35 year old soccer moms, <laughs> right? I mean, these are people that are, um, you know, um, entering mid, these are mid career professionals. And, and, and it's like, well, come on, <laughs> you clearly don't understand exactly what you're talking about. But, you know, if you think a millennial is a high school student. Um, but anyway, with bacteria, which is a type of prokaryotic cell, a generation can be minutes, right? So not only do you have horizontal gene transfer, but bacteria can also divide through binary fission very quickly, efficiently, and rapidly. And so a generation can be like in minutes, right? And so the ability to adapt and respond to environmental changes is, it occurs very rapidly in prokaryotic cells. And prokaryotic organisms tend to be unicellular. Now, that's not to say that they can't cooperate. Uh, for example, bacteria can cooperate and bacteria can come into um, close them while they can secrete various substances and kind of work together as a kind of work together in, in, in some sense as a, as, as a unit. In fact, we see this in lots of infections where lots of bacteria come together and they line something and that's something referred to as a biofilm. But with eukaryotic organisms, what you have is you have different types of cells, right? Many different types of cells can come together, right? And you can have highly specialized cells, right? Coming together to form an organism. And so the organ eukaryotic organisms can be, they're not always, they can be multicellular. There are definitely some unicellular eukaryotic organisms, but they have the ability to be multicellular. So you've got lots of complex complexity and they do a lot of metabolic stuff. They make a lot of energy and they can develop high order uh, systems like a nervous system and think and, and, and develop uh, rocket ships and go to other planets. But um, the prokaryotic cells also have a lot of cool things they can do. And even though 
you know, they seem very simple that that simplicity and that ability to rapidly respond to changes um, does allow them uh, to do quite well. Um, they may not be contemplating literature, right? May not be arguing about um, who Plato really was and what the allegory of the cave was all about, but they're still incredibly successful organisms nonetheless, and they've caused us lots of headache as a human race, right? Um, so that's kind of some differences there. And so the classic example of a prokaryotic cell would be a bacteria, whereas eukaryotic cells would be um, any kind of animal that you can think of for the most part is gonna be eukaryotic. All right, everybody okay, okay there with that? Um, so when we talk about the major cellular functions, you know, what goes on with the cell? I want you to think of movement, right? Cells need to get around. For example, muscle cells. Some cells have um, uh, little motor proteins inside of them and they look cool. They're, they're cool looking proteins and literally like have little feet that walk around they attach to the cytoskeleton and they can walk around inside of the cells and transport things around um, really neat stuff. And some cells have flagella that come out of them that propel them through their environment. But movement is one of the main functions. Okay. Conduction. So conducting information, we see that in neurons, for example, but this can be done uh, chemically as well. Well, neurons are electrochemical, but this can be done purely chemically as well, such as the endocrine or exocrine function. Um, cells secrete stuff. All right, we see this in our body, such as mucus, mucus, saliva, tear secretion. All right, we see excretion. So excretion is the removal of waste. We see respiration. What is respiration? Well, respiration is essentially, at least in um, eukaryotic cells, for the most part, even in the human body, there are some eukaryotic cells that don't, um, don't do respiration through the, the quote unquote normal mechanisms, aerobic mechanism, but essentially respiration is about using high energy molecules, ATP, typically through oxygen. Um, there are other uh, cells that, um, prokaryotic cells that uh, respire through very different mechanisms. Um, and they may not require a TCA cycle and electron transport like eukaryotic cells. And then even among eukaryotic cells, there's some variety, right? For example, um, plant cells uh, use a mechanism known as photosynthesis for producing ATP, uh, whereas animals use um, something referred to as the chemoosmotic theory, which includes uh, the, the Krebs cycle or the TCA cycle and electron transport. Electron transport is often or also referred to as oxidative phosphorylation, right? Those two things mean the same thing, but you have respiration occurring nonetheless. Reproduction, right? All right, and we talked about mitosis and meiosis. Communication. This is typically chemical, right? This is often referred to as chemotaxis. Chemotaxis or chemical communication is a really important part of the immune system, for example, right? When cells are, are damaged and dying, they release what are called chemokines and histamine can get released and these molecules activate uh, typically the innate uh, um, immune system. We'll talk about the innate versus the adaptive immune system in great detail. I believe tomorrow is when we cover immunopathology. Um, but you've got that. And then, of course, you have absorption. And you hopefully learned about all the various ways cells can absorb 
right? Through simple diffusion, through facilitated diffusion, uh, through active transport. Active transport key um, is moving against a gradient, concentration gradient. Um, and that can include penocytosis, phagocytosis, ion channels, and so on. Um, so those are the main functions, right, of the cell. So when we go in and we talk about disease, this is a pathology class, of course, right? So something causes cell damage, right? Oftentimes, this is due to hypoperfusion, ischemia, hypoxia. That's like super common, but in the case, um, cells attempt to adapt. And we talked about some of the ways that cells can adapt. And then they can repair, right? They can repair, you know, if the insult is reversible, right? If, however, it is irreversible, if we're talking about irreversible, they'll tend to compensate the best they can. Some cells are very good at compensating. Other cells, not so good, right? Muscle cells, for example, are very good at compensating uh, in the setting of an anaerobic environment, right? Muscles actually contain proteins called myoglobin. And myoglobin is a lot like hemoglobin. It actually contains oxygen. So when you put muscle cells into a, a, an ischemic, hypoperfused, or hypoxic state, um, they are able to maintain um, cell respiration uh, for a couple hours in some cases, whereas other cells like neurons in your brain have little to no compensatory capacity in the setting of uh, hypoperfusion or um, in the setting of uh, low oxygen, right? But whatever the case, the cell attempts to compensate, eventually it begins to fail. And then of course, as cells begin to fail, that leads to tissue failure, right? Remember tissues, two or more cell types working together make up tissues. And then as the tissues fail, you see the organs fail. And then the organ systems fail. And look at this, the whole, right, the visions of life that we talked about. And eventually we see that manifest in the organism. All right. So now what I want to do is I want to talk just a little bit about how cells differentiate because this will be important in, in hematology, which is the next thing I'm going to talk about. Uh, so essentially what you have are what are called progenitor cells. Does anyone know what a vernacular term for a progenitor cell is? kind of a common term that people use to. Like a parent cell? Um, not necessarily. So these are like the, these are the cells from which all, these are like, um, they're, you can kind of think of them as parents, but we have different cell lineages or cell lines in our body right? And like cells of, from the nervous system and the GI tract come from a certain cell line. Um, cells from your blood, for example, come from a certain cell line. And those OG cells that all those different cell lines come from, those progenitor cells are also referred to as what? This is kind of a common term that you hear used. Stem cells? Stem cells, yeah, they're referred to as stem cells. And so what happens is these stem cells are dividing and they produce what are known as immature cells. And then these immature cells, different chemical signals act on those those immature cells and typically what they'll do is they will turn off and turn on of genes so 
even though when we talked a little bit about genetics earlier in pathophysiology with the macromolecules, um, just every cell with the exception of you know, things like the blood cells that you know, don't have nucleus and don't really do a whole lot of metabolism, um, every cell in your body has a complete copy of your genome, right? Your genome, right? Or your genotype, right, are, is the unique set of genes, tens of thousands of genes that you know make up you. Um, but not every cell uses every gene, and so what happens is lots of genes get turned on and turned off, right? And in that process, and it's very complicated, lots of feedback mechanisms, lots of different intermediate molecules, uh, hormones, um, a, you know, cytokines, uh, different cell signaling molecules. It's a really complicated mess of stuff. But what happens is genes get turned on and turned off, and that causes those immature cells to mature into whatever is needed at the time into the specialized form, into the specialized mature cell. So you have these different cell lines throughout the body, right? Um, and I'm going to use the example of uh, the blood cells, just because we're going to be talking a little bit about hematology here in just a bit. Um, and so we might well use different blood cell lines. Um, and so let's just talk about some of the um, blood cell lines or lineages that, that, that we have. Um, so interestingly enough, all of your major blood cells come from one single stem cell, one single stem cell. So let me just go down and let's just draw this out here. Um, and then it differentiates out into these other cell lines. So you have your OG blood stem cell here, all right, and that is referred to as a hemocytoblast. He means blood, site means cell, and then blast, hemocytoblast. This is sometimes referred to as a multipotential hematopoietic stem cell or hemocytoblast. And these hemocytoblasts produce one or two many types of cells. Let me just draw them there. They produce what are called the myeloid cells. These are awful, also referred to as the myeloid progenitor cells. And they produce what are known as the lymphoid. progenitor cells, or sometimes these are referred to as the common myeloid and the common lymphoid, all right? And then the myeloid cells, right, as they're produced, they will further differentiate into other subtypes. For example, they may differentiate into thrombocytes, also known as platelets, right? Um, they may differentiate into erythrocytes, also known as red blood cells or RBCs. They may differentiate into what are called mast cells. These are cells that contain um, histamine, right? And they degranulate, they rupture and release histamine. And that's part of the immune response. And they may also differentiate into what are known as myeloblast cells. Look something like that. And then the myeloblast cells further differentiate 
into other subcell types, into some major white blood cell types, um, your basophils, your neutrophils, um, your eosinophils, and your monocytes. And there's further subdivision from there as well. Like for example, monocytes, when monocytes leave the blood, which they can, they leave the blood and they go into tissues, they actually further differentiate into something called a macrophage or a macrophage. So macrophage or macrophage is just a differentiated or a further matured monocyte, right? So those are all of the different cells that come out of the myeloid progenitor, your platelet, your red blood cell, your mast cells, your basophils, oops, your basophils, your neutrophils, your eosinophils, your monocytes, macrophage, all come out of the myeloblast. And so sometimes when there are certain diseases of the, uh, the blood, various blood cancers, for example, um, sometimes what they do is they'll talk about them as to which, which cell line is diseased, like the myeloid, right? Uh, and for example, um, does anyone know what the general, what the most general term is for a cancer that affects um, the white blood cells, for example? Leukemia. Leukemia. Yeah, leukemia is the broad name for a cancer involving the white blood cells. And then there it, we further subdivide that into acute leukemia or chronic leukemia, right? And then what we do is we further subdivide it into which cell line is involved. For example, a common one that we see in kids is something like AML acute myeloid leukemia, well, clearly that is a leukemia that impacts the myeloid cell line. So you have, um, you have essentially out of control, right? Uh, cell division involving the myeloid lineage and you have increased numbers uh, of white blood cells that are undifferentiated and um, actually cause them, you know, compromise and, you know, suppression, right? However, on the other side, the lymphoid uh, lineage, uh, the lymph lymphoid progenitor cells, okay, they further subdivide into two major types. They subdivide into what are known as the NKT cells, this is also known as the natural, kill, natural killer T cells, all right? And into what are called the small lymphocytes. So this is where your lymphocytes come from, the, the lymphoid uh, lineage. And then the small lymphocytes further subdivide into the T, the helper T, not the natural killer T, the helper T, and then what are known as the B lymphocytes. And then the B lymphocytes further mature into what are known as plasma cells. These are sometimes referred to as effector cells. And these are actually the cells that produce antibodies, right? So these are the cells that produce antibodies, the plasma cells, those are mature lymphocytes. The T lymphocytes and helper T's actually help activate, um, help convert B lymphocytes into uh, plasma cells. And then the natural killer T cells um, go around and they try to find either virus infected cells or cells that are not functioning or cells that are uh, dividing uh, in abnormal ways and are becoming cancerous in the natural killer T cells. Um, signal those cells and tell them to kill themselves, and they signal apoptosis, right? Um, and there's a whole kind of like handshaking uh, mechanism involving uh, proteins on the surfaces of these cells 
uh, and the major protein system is something known as MHC, major histocompatibility complex. And there's MHC1 and MHC2, and this will become more relevant when we talk about uh, the body identifying um, self cells versus non self cells and viral infected cells because the MHC proteins that are expressed become different. Um, and this is actually relevant for cancer as well because any like malignant for, uh, well, just cancer cells in general, um, lots of different cancer cells actually get around the immune system by not having the right kind of MHC proteins. And so when that natural killer T cell comes in and says, hey, you've become a cancer cell, it can't signal apoptosis and that tumor continues to grow or it continues to metastasize. And so cancers can be very resistant to the immune system. Um, and this is actually a, a, a therapeutic avenue is developing, um, developing what are known as immunotherapies to try to train the immune system to identify and eliminate these, these abnormal, these cancerous cells. Right. All right. So are there any questions about, and this is just this, what I just talked about here. This is just the, um, this is just the, the blood cells, right? We're not talking about anything else. So you can see how complicated this is. And even this is a, a very simplified version of it, but hopefully it kind of gives you a taste for how you can get all of this complex differentiation. Uh, so are there any questions about any of that? Anybody have any questions? I'm all good here. Oh, go ahead, I'm sorry. No, okay, I don't see anything in chat. Okay, excellent, well, we'll move on. So what I wanna do now, it, because this is gonna be relevant a little later on when we talk about infections, is I wanna talk a little bit about something called hematology. Hematology is the study of blood. And there is a very important lab test. I keep hearing, uh, uh, here we go. Uh, I keep hearing, some, I think I found it. I just muted you um, just because I was getting a lot of feedback from the audio coming through. Um, so hematology is the study of blood. And there is a very special blood test. It's very commonly done. Um, and it is referred to as the complete blood count. also known as the CBC. So we talked about blood chemistries. So we've talked about arterial blood gases. We talked about blood chemistries. We talked about some specialized blood tests like the lactate um, in people who are sh in shock. Um, but the CBC is looking at the, primarily looking at the white and red blood cells. We're not gonna go through every single thing that a CBC looks at but we're gonna talk about the major things. And there are some shorthand ways of charting this. So just like with the blood chemistry, specifically the BMP or the Chem7, the basic metabolic panel, right? Where you have the fishbone shorthand. So you get your sodium, potassium, chloride, the venous CO2, also known as a bicarb, the blood urea, nitrogen, the creatinine, and the glucose. Um, the CBC, there is a shorthand way of charting or documenting the most common or most relevant CBC value that we're going to talk about. Today. And so what goes here is something known as the WBC, the white blood cell count. And then up here is something known as the hemoglobin. Underneath it is a hematocrit. And then over here is the platelet count. Now there are several other, um, other values or other things that a CBC looks at, but these four things are we're gonna focus on. 
All right. So the white blood count, it looks at the overall number of white blood cells, uh, white blood cell concentration in your blood, right? The WBC. And that is reported in thousands of cells per, all right, so this is actually concentration. This is reported in thousands of cells per cubic millimeter. So not cubic centimeter, but rather cubic millimeter, all right? And the normal value varies a little bit between men and women, biological men and women. So in biological men, the, uh, the value tends to be, oh, actually, it's, I'm, I'm going to say it's fairly, it's actually fairly, um, fairly similar between men and women. We don't need to subdivide it too much. So I'm going to keep it the same. Again, I want to try to simplify this as much as we can. Uh, and it's anywhere from like 3.8 uh, to, to 10,000 cells per cubic millimeter. And this is going to vary a little bit from lab to lab. So every lab is going to have a slightly different reference range that they're using. And the cool thing about the lab, as you're looking at the lab values, it will tell you whether that is a high or low value, all right? And then the hemoglobin or the HBG is looking at the concentration of hemoglobin in the blood. So hemoglobin primarily exists um, within the red blood cells. And this does vary a bit uh, from men, biological men and biological women. So in the bio male, the hemoglobin is going to be a little higher, uh, 14, 18 is measured in grams per deciliter. Deciliter is 100 milliliters or a tenth of a liter. Um, and in the female, the biological female, it uh, varies from 11 to 16 grams per deciliter. So a little on the lower side, slightly lower. And then the hematocrit. Does anyone know what the hematocrit is? HCT or the hematocrit. Anyone know what that is? So the hematocrit is when I take a sample of blood, so I draw a sample of blood, and this typically comes from a vein. This is a venous blood sample. Um, so here is a sample of blood, right? Now, blood is a living tissue, and that is to say that you have cells embedded within a matrix. That's what makes up a tissue. Um, one of the things that we do when we in the lab when we test blood is, is we take that tube of blood, right? So here's your tube of blood that you've drawn. And we put it in a centrifuge and we spin it around very fast. And what happens is the heavy parts of that blood, the, the heavy elements of the blood sink to the bottom and the lighter stuff stays on top. And what happens is after that blood has been spun down, you've got all the heavy stuff down at the bottom here. And then on top of it, you have the lighter stuff. And it, it's kind of a clear yellowish color. That lighter watery stuff is referred to as the plasma, the blood plasma. This is where most of the water is um and then there are smaller proteins like albumin and um albumin and um immunoglobulins or antibodies that are floating around as well as clotting factors and then the heavier stuff that sinks down these are the packed or the formed elements and these mainly include white blood cells and red blood cells and so what they do is look at the whole blood sample 
and the plasma plus the formed elements equals 100%. And then they say, okay, what percentage of that is the formed elements? So this is at about 50%, 50-50. Um, so 50% of the entire sample of blood consists of form elements, and that is what the hematocrit is. It's a percentage of the entire sample of blood that is um, the formed elements, all right? Um, and this does vary between men and women. All right, so in the bio, bio male, uh, you're looking at uh, anywhere from, and this is going to vary a little bit from lab to lab, but anywhere from 40 to 54 percent, whereas in the biological female, you're looking at like 35 to 47 percent, a little lower. So the hemoglobin and hematocrit are a little lower in, in bio women than men, and why is this the case? Who knows? But there you go. And then finally, the platelet count is the number of thrombocytes or platelets, right? This tells us something about clotting, all right? And you actually have quite a bit of platelets. And platelets are actually, they're not actually cells. They're actually little cell fragments. So they're actually very tiny. Um, and does anyone happen to know what the normal platelet count is? Just out of curiosity. Maybe I'll pose that question for y'all. Does anyone happen to know what the normal platelet count is? And it's, spoiler alert, it's, it's very high. Isn't it a thousand or... 1500 oh it's it, it's an order of magnitude so a hundred yeah uh, the low end is 150,000 so it's 150,000 to 450,000 cells per cubic millimeter right so there are a whole bunch of platelets so when we look at these values now that we kind of know what they are there is some terminology right? And the terminology is as follows. If you see the term hemia, that equals a low count. If you see the term cytosis, that equals a high count. So for example, if somebody has leukopenia, what does that mean? What does leukopenia mean? A white low blood white blood cell count. A low white blood count. So a count, a white blood count generally less than 3.8. Whereas on the other hand, leukocytosis would be an elevated white count above 10,000. 10 or 11,000 cells, right? Um, whereas with platelet, a low platelet count would be thrombopenia. And then a high platelet count would be thrombocytosis. Now, what we do with the hemoglobin and hematocrit, because they're not actually looking at cells, right? Can't use penia and cytosis because they're not they're indirectly looking at cells, but they're not directly looking at cell counts. And so typically what we do is we look at the hemoglobin and hematocrit together, and people often refer to this as somebody's H and H. And if the hemoglobin and hematocrit is low, that is a condition known as anemia. Literally means without blood, but in the medical context, it means a low hemoglobin and hematocrit count and that might impair the ability for someone to transport and deliver oxygen if it gets too low, right? And then there is also, if your hemoglobin hematocrit is too elevated, that is something we refer to as polycythemia. Oops, 
polycythemia and elevated hemoglobin hematocrit. All right. So you got anemia and polycythemia. All right. Everybody, everybody okay there? So what I want to do is I want to focus now um, more on the white blood count. We will actually have a hematology lecture later on in the paramedic pipeline during um, med, med block one, I believe, is where you have a full hematology lecture. But what I want to do is I want to focus on the white count now since the theme of today is kind of um, infectious pathology, if you will. Um, but we'll talk about the white blood count, all right? Something that's very important to understand is what, what are the implications of a low or high white count? So a low white count, leukopenia, the implications are that this patient's going to be immunocompromised. And there are many things that can cause leukopenia. So if you see leukopenia, you got to think, okay, what are things that could cause this? Is, is this somebody who is receiving immune modifying medications, right? Uh, there are many medications out there, so-called chemotherapeutics that treat cancers, for example, um, that suppress the immune system, right? So you want to think about that. There are other drugs that are used purposely to suppress the immune system and to treat so-called autoimmune disorders where the immune system is attacking the body. Um, so things like steroids, right? Uh, steroids uh, and various other agents like methotrexate, for example, and uh, drugs used to treat various um, autoimmune disorders such as rheumatoid arthritis, systemic lupus erythematosus or SLE, um, Crohn's disease, ulcerative colitis, um, and so on and so forth, right? Uh, and there are also medications used to treat chronic inflammatory uh, lung diseases, such as COPD and asthma, um, where immunosuppression may occur, right? Uh, steroids, for example, may be used, right? So you've got an immunocompromised or immunosuppressed patient there. Now, leukocytosis, on the other hand, An elevated white count can be due to lots of different things. It can be due to stress, acute stress. And in, um, intro, in intro to advanced care, um, you all should have talked a little bit about um, health and wealth. And there's something called the uh, general adaptation syndrome or the GAS. And that's when somebody is... Uh, uh, somebody um, goes through a traumatic event or something that produces a lot of stress. There's a whole syndrome, uh, a whole biochemical, biopsychosocial um, process that occurs where you have activation of the uh, sympathetic immune system. Uh, you have a release of cortisol and that suppresses the, the immune system, right? And all your resources get diverted toward fight or flight, toward surviving the experience. And if that continues for an extended period of time, then you have these long-term effects that occur as you enter that exhaust, as you transition out of the resistance phase and enter the exhaustion phase of the GAS. And this is where you're prone to developing infections and um, other things. Um, so stress can cause leukopenia and leukocytosis. Um, and so we also see this in trauma. Um, talking specifically about injury, right? So somebody has a traumatic injury that actually causes an activation of the immune system to try to identify and, and begin um, the process of dealing with this, this damage. And so you do have a bump in your, in your white blood count in response to that. And an elevated white count is commonly caused by infection. All right, infection. So leukocytosis by itself isn't very helpful. It needs to be taken into context with what's going on in the patient. So does the patient have signs and symptoms suggesting an acute infection, right? Uh, fever, chills, 
right? A, a cough that a productive cough with green sputum, right? Or, or um, maybe they have a bur a dysuria, a dyspyrenia, burning urination, pain around the perennial area, uh, chills, costal vertebral CVA angle uh, pain. And you're thinking, okay, so maybe this is a urinary tract infection or a respiratory tract infection or a wound that has become infected. Um, and then you see the white counts elevated and you can kind of put those together. And so the, the white blood count provides additional evidence. Um, but one of the things that the white count by itself doesn't do is it doesn't tell you which part of the white blood cells, so what, what's really going on, what's actually elevated, because there are five general categories of white blood cells, right? And I always remember the term never let monkeys eat bananas. Never let monkeys eat bananas. That's kind of how I remember the, the general types of white blood cells. So the N is the neutrophils. And these are the most numerous white blood cells. Let are the lymphocytes. Monkeys are the monocytes. Eat are the eosinophils, and B are the basophils. Let me put dots after those. There we go. So never let monkeys eat bananas. Those are the five categories of white blood cells. So if somebody has a leukocytosis, what we tend to what, what we tend to need to do is investigate lab wise a little further. So we'll look at the white blood count. If it's elevated, you will look at something called the differential. The differential. This is sometimes referred to as a manual diff as well. And essentially what a differential is, is it looks at the five categories of white cells and you look for which one is elevated. All right. So if you have leukocytosis, look at the differential, right? And you look for which of those cells happens to be elevated. The one that I'm going to focus on today because it is relevant for acute infections happens to be the neutrophils. The neutrophils are the most numerous of the white blood cells um, and something like 50 to 80%. Yeah, Stephen, go ahead. Uh, what was the E? Eosinophil. Cell? Yeah, those are the eosinophils. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm, no problem. Everybody okay there? Okay, cool. Cool, great. Um, so what we're going to do is we're specifically going to talk about the neutrophils. All right. So if you have leukocytosis, Look at the manual diff and the neutrophils. If the neutrophils are elevated, so neutrophils are normally about 50 to 80% of the total amount of white blood cells. And so if the neutrophil count is above 80%, what we're gonna do, we're gonna look and to see, look and see what kind of neutrophil is actually elevated. All right. All right. And you essentially have two types, all right? You have what are called banded neutrophils, and these are often referred to as bands. Those are banded neutrophils, all right? And banded neutrophils, think of bands as babies. These are babies. Banded neutrophils are babies. And it has to do with the way the nucleus is shaped, all right? And some white blood cells like um, neutrophils, the nucleus is, um, is uh, it's, it's polymorphic. It has, um, it's not like just one nucleus. It has kind of a more complex character to it. Um, and the way that the nucleus, the way the nucleus looks tells you something about how mature that that specific neutrophil is. 
So a banded uh, neutrophil is a neutrophil that um, is uh, immature, if you will, right? It's uh, immature and its nucleus hasn't had time to segment off essentially. And that gives you the second type of neutrophils known as the segments or the segs. And these are mature. These are grown up and mature neutrophils and banded neutrophils, these baby neutrophils um, are only like one to 5%, right? Whereas the uh, segmented neutrophils are gonna be much higher obviously. Um, so what you're gonna do is look at the white blood count. If there's leukocytosis, look at the manual differential, look at the neutrophils. If the neutrophils are elevated, figure out which of the two types of neutrophils is elevated. If the bands are elevated greater than about five or 6%, and some people say you should never have more than a six pack of bands. So no more than a six pack of bands. All right. And if we see this, that means that the body is pumping out immature neutrophils, baby neutrophils. Essentially what the body's doing is it is sending children to the front lines because neutrophils are front line, um, non-specific phagocytic cells, right? Um, they're, uh, 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 once uh, our physical barriers are penetrated by injury and or pathogens, then these are the frontline soldiers, if you will, right? Um, and so what's happening is in this setting, when you have elevated bands, this means that the body is under acute attack. You have an acute infection typically, right? And the body is sending immature neutrophils to the front lines. They don't have time to mature right? This is an acute situation. We're being acutely invaded. And this is often referred to as a left shift. So when you're receiving a report on somebody and they say this patient has leukocytosis with a left shift, right? That what they're telling you, what that provider is telling you is that this patient has an elevated white count, their neutrophils are elevated and their immature neutrophils are elevated. Um, that's what the left shift means. Um, left shift is just a term. It's an old school term that comes from when we would literally look at a microscope and literally do cell counts. Um, and the, you have these plates with these little lines on them. And maybe some of you, if you've taken my microbiology and microbiology class, you may have actually done this or something like this. I remember um, when I took microbiology um, and molecular biology, we actually had to do this um, in, in, as, as one of our lab exercises, do a manual differential. Um, I don't know if they do that anymore, but um, on the upper left part of the microscope slide um, is where these specific neutrophils would kind of, would kind of go. Um, and so you would see more of them on the left side of the, of the slide. And that's where the term left shift came from is those bands would be there on the left. Um, and so it's just kind of a, a historical term that people still use a lot. Now, if the segmented neutrophils are elevated, that generally means there's some, something chronic going on, some, maybe some chronic infection, you know, maybe like tuberculosis or something like that. Um, this is not an acute process. All right. So any questions over any of that stuff? Okay, I'm just making sure I don't miss any messages. Okay, I wanna talk about one last thing before we take our first break. I know we've gone a little late here. Um, and this is just something to help you all better remember the general normal value. So I talked about specific normal values for men and women, um, but there is also something referred to as the rule of threes the rule of threes. 
So what we do is you start at your white blood count, right? And your normal white blood count should be about five. So I'm just going to put five there, right? Plus or minus about five, you know, five to 10, right? And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to multiply five by three. Times is going to give me 15, and that's going to give me plus or minus for men and women in general, a normal hemoglobin, right? And then I'm going to multiply the hemoglobin by three, all right? And that is going to give me or the 15 by three, excuse me. And that's going to give me 45. So 5, 15, 45, multiplying by three, right? And then I just put a one here and a five zero, a 150 for the platelets. So 5, 15, 45, 150. You're multiplying by three, at least from white blood count to hemoglobin hematocrit. So that's just a down and dirty way of memorizing the kind of what, what you should generally see with the values without getting too in detail, right? Uh, so I just wanted to give you that little tool there. Now, obviously, what we're going to do is we're going to have access to the lab, and the lab will tell you whether it's high or low. There'll be a little H or a little L after the value, so it's, it's really helpful there. Um, so... I wouldn't expect you to memorize values so much in this in this class, but there they are. Okay, any questions before we take our first break? Because I am mindful of the time. Okay, I've got 938. So let's see here. Let's come back at 9. 955, let's go 955, we'll make it 955, easy to remember. So I'll see you all back at 955. All right. So before we uh, continue on, are there any questions? I know we've covered quite a bit of uh, content already. And that was, uh, that first one was, was a bit on the long side. So are there any questions? Anybody have any questions so far? All right. Well, what I want to do now is I want to talk just a little bit about some of the terminology uh, surrounding infections, since that's kind of the direction we're moving toward, talking a little bit about infections. Um, and so there is some terminology that we need to be aware of, generally speaking. So when you hear the term sepsis, What does that mean? When we say someone has sepsis or someone is septic, what does that actually mean? That there's a infection in their blood. Uh, yeah, moving in the right direction. Um, so it doesn't necessarily mean that there's an, an, an infection in the sense that there is uh, an organism that is actively dividing and causing problems. But sepsis just literally means that the patient has microorganisms detected in the blood. Yeah. And typically, more often than not, the microorganism um, is going to be a bacteria. You're not screen sharing there, Chris. Oh, yeah. Thanks for letting me know, I guess. Let's see here. Let's try it. There we go. There we go. We're sorted. There we go. All right. Let me give that a minute to catch up. There we go. Yeah. So sepsis is a presence of microorganisms in the in the blood. So this may or may not become more problematic. Um, so sep that's kind of where the starting point, you know, we say, okay, someone is septic. That means that they have microorganisms in their blood. Now, there are some other terms that we need to be aware of, right? And there is a term called SIRS. And 
sepsis may cause SIRS. There are some other things that can cause SIRS, uh, mainly infections, but there are uh, trauma and other medical conditions can cause a SIRS response as well. But just talk about SIRS. So SIRS stands for systemic inflammatory response syndrome. And so really what SIRS is, it is a four general findings. There are four criteria that we look at. And if somebody has at least two of the four criteria, we say that they have SIRS. All right. And so let's talk about what the four criterions, criteria um, are. So if the patient has a fever, temperature that is greater than 38 degrees Celsius. Does anyone know what the normal, what normal body temperature is in Celsius? Or is it 34, 36? 30, about 37 is normal body temperature. That's nine, about 98.6 right in there. All right. So greater than 38 or less than 36 or less than 36 degrees Celsius. The reason being is that some people, particularly elderly people, people who are immunocompromised, they may respond differently to bad infections. So instead of elevating their temperature, their temperature may actually drop. And in some people, um, typically, typically what happens is when you get an infection, initially you will enter what's called a hyperdynamic phase where your respiratory rate increases, um, your heart rate increases, your cardiac output may increase, your temperature increases, right? Everything's increasing and you, you're in a hyperdynamic environment. And then that may or may not give way to something called the hypodynamic. Some people refer to this the quote unquote warm phase and the quote, quote unquote cold or cool phase. And this is where you see everything decreasing as, they're, as they develop a septic shock, a distributive, they have vasodilation, they have myocardial depression, and so on and so forth. Some people, such as elderly people and people who are immunocompromised, may transition right into that, that cool phase. And so they may present as hypothermic as opposed to hyperthermic or hyperpyrexic or febrile. So we want to keep that in mind. The second criteria is tachycardia. Patient needs to be tachycardic. So they need to have greater than 90. The third criterion is tachypnea. That's an inflation in respiratory rate greater than 20. Of course, we're talking more of the adult patient here. And then finally, the fourth criterion comes from labs. Patients need to have either a leukocytosis. All right. Greater than 12. Remember, 5 to 10 is normal. Or a leukopenia. Because again, some people, elderly and immunocompromised patients, can't mount the typical immune response that we would expect to see, all right? And so this would be a white count of generally less than four. So if they have any two, at least two of these four criteria, they have SEERS, right? So if somebody has an infection of two of these four criteria, they also have SEERS, which means that they have inflammation occurring throughout their body. It's systemic, all right? And that's SIRS.
Now, there is another term referred to as severe sepsis. All right, severe sepsis. Severe sepsis is someone who has to be septic, first of all. So they're septic. Plus, and this is what makes it severe sepsis, plus they have, have signs and symptoms of org dysfunction. All right. This can be a variety of findings. I'll give you some examples, right? For example, if their brain is not being perfused very well, they may develop altered mental status, right? That's end organ dysfunction. They may have a decrease in urinary output, right? We call that oliguria or anuria. It would be no urinary output, right? A decrease in urinary output. Um, and that may also be associated with an increase in the BUN and creatinine. Remember, the BUN and creatinine will elevate as the kidneys um, develop dysfunction. All right, so altered mental status, decreased urinary output. Um, commonly, we see a decrease in the pH. Acidosis, right, is going to be common in severe sepsis, septic patients. Uh, um, you could see an elevation in the liver function tests if the liver's taking a hit, right, and so on and so forth. So if you have a, a patient who is septic, a septus, plus signs and symptoms of organ dysfunction, then we say that this patient has severe sepsis. And then the other thing that I want to mention, well, one of the other things is something called septic shock. Septic shock. So a lot of people confuse sepsis and septic septic shock. These are not the same thing. You've got sepsis, you've got severe sepsis, you've got septic shock. And typically, somebody with severe sepsis or septic shock will also be in SIRS. Right? So septic shock is the following. A patient has a decreased blood pressure all right, that requires pressure. support following fluid resuscitation. So essentially, this is somebody with severe sepsis that develops a low blood pressure in, right? Preschool pressure, we put that on there. And for the, for se the sake of sepsis, we tend to go off of something called the mean arterial pressure, the max, that's kind of the average, um, the average pressure in the arterial system. Um, and the value that we shoot for is 65 millimeters of mercury. So if the mean arterial pressure, if we cannot get the mean arterial pressure up with adequate fluid resuscitation, and we need to add vasopressors to try to get the blood pressure up. That is what means somebody's in septic shock. So we can't say they're in septic shock if their blood pressure is low. It's if their blood pressure remains low despite fluid resuscitation. That's what makes um, septic shock. So here's the question. Is the mean arterial pressure something that we can easily identify or calculate in the pre-hospital environment. What do you all think? Yes. Yes. It actually is. Yeah, it's very easy. Um, most of the monitors, most of our, our monitors that perform non-invasive blood pressure monitoring will do this automatically, but does anyone happen to know what the formula for mean arterial pressure is? You're gonna have to be able to calculate this. This is a critical calculation for paramedics, but does anyone know what the, well, there are many formulae, but can anyone tell me what a formula for mean arterial pressure is? 
I think it's a systolic plus diastolic plus diastolic divided by two. You're on the right track. Yeah. So the way that I think about this is um, mean, when we talk about mean, mean in this sense means average or the central tendency. Right, the central tendency. So this actually comes from statistics. Um, and in statistics, when we're looking at a collection of data, there are different ways to kind of figure out, okay, what's, where does the data seem to be centering? Is there some value that the data is kind of centering around? And then from that, there's the mean, the median, and the mode. Um, we're going to focus on the mean. And so what you do is, is you, you add up all the individual values and then you divide by the number of those values. For example, if I score a 100% on test A and a 50% on test B, right? The average, the overall, the mean score is just adding the values of those tests up. So that gives me 150 and then dividing by the total number of tests, right? So in this case, it's going to be 150 divided by 2. 2 times 7 is 14. That gives me 75%. That would be the mean, right? Or the average of 150. That's assuming that each test is weighted the same, right? The problem with blood pressure is blood pressure, say 120 over 80, you know, which is generally considered your generic normal blood pressure. Um, these are not weighted the same. And that is to say that you spend more time in diastole than systole, right? You spend about twice the amount of time in diastole, and diastole is when the ventricles are filling up, right? The atria are contracting, and blood is flowing. Um, some blood flowing passively, and some blood, blood is flowing due to the atrial contraction, and it takes time to fill the ventricles. And so you spend about twice the amount of time in diastole as you do systole. And so you have to weight diastole heavier when you're at, when you're finding the average or the mean number. And so the formula that comes out of that is you spend one part of your time in systole. So that's the systolic, right? Plus, and then you spend two parts of the time in diastole. So two times diastolic. And then you divide the whole thing by three because it's three total parts of time, right? One part time is spent in systole, two parts, two, two parts time diastole. So you got to divide everything by three. And so the easiest formula for mean arterial pressure is systolic plus two times diastolic, the whole thing divided by three, all right? So for example, with 120 over 80, I would put 120 here, 80 here, and that would be 120 plus uh, 160, right? 120 plus 160, right? That's two times 80, all right? It's eight, 280, and then 280 divided by three. So that's, see, three times 10 is 30, so that's gonna be nine. 27, 93 and some change, 93.3 continuing. So this patient would have a, a mean arterial pressure of about 93 millimeters. And then you would calculate it uh, should you encounter this. And it's very likely that you would uh, encounter uh, mean arterial pressure calculation. Uh, so we, at a minimum, we want to get 
the mean arterial pressure to 65 uh, to perfuse the brain and vital organs. And if it's less than that, then that is severe hypoperfusion to specifically the brain, heart, and the kids, right? It's organs that are very sensitive to hypoperfusion and don't have the ability to adapt very easily. So if we have to give vasopressors to get that pressure to 65 or above, that is what puts somebody in septic shock, right? That's what makes somebody in septic shock is the definition. It's not just that they're septic, okay? Not just that they're septic. Everybody okay there? Hey, Chris. Yes, sir. What's the what's the range from 65 to what is the highest you anticipate for a map? Uh, so your normal map is like 70 to 100. Like your normal, like what you what you like to see is like like 70 to 100. Right in there for your mean arterial pressure. Um, so 65 is like the bear. Like this is this is at least we're perfusing the brain, the heart, and the keys, somewhat okay, right? So 65 is not a great map. It's just, that's like the minimum that we would, we want to allow at all. And if we're struggling to even get their mean arterial pressure to 65 and we're having to give vasopressors, then that is what makes somebody in septic shock, right? That so they have- yeah, no problem. So they have to. So the difference between sepsis and septic shock really is um, the the blood pressure. And the big thing here is fluid resuscitation. So we need to give them fluid first. And and fluid resuscitation is a very important part of the initial management of some sepsis. So if somebody has sepsis, specifically severe sepsis, right? So they're septic with signs and symptoms of, of organ dysfunction, then um, and their blood pressure is low, we will give them fluids first, right? Give them repeated bolus typically of, of, of crystalloids or balanced solutions like plasma light, which um, is, is isotonically balanced, um, and try to get their blood pressure, their mean arterial pressure back up. And if it Fails right after repeated, you know, 500 milliliter boluses, and you give several boluses, and the blood pressure is not responding. Then at that point, you can you can make the determination or the decision that hey, this is septic shock. I need to start adding vasopressors on um, to augment the the uh, patient's blood pressure. In addition to that, antibiotics are going to be very important, and something called source control. Has anyone ever heard of that term, source control? in reference to uh, infections. So source control refers to finding where the infection is and surgically, typically, surgically getting as much of that infection out as possible, right? So for example, if I have like a large abscess, maybe I have a wound abscess and I have a large abscess um, that is developed in a part of my body, finding that abscess, opening it up and draining it out, that would be an example of source control. Or maybe I have a large collection of pus in my pleural cavity that's called an empyema, right? Going in, um, putting, uh, doing a thoracostomy, putting a tube in there and draining that, 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 in, that cavity out, right? Um, that would be an example of source control. Or if I have appendicitis, that is an appendix that is ruptured and I'm developing peritonitis, opening my abdomen, removing the appendix, right? Washing the abdomen out, right? Um, that would be an example of source control. Or maybe I have a fracture, an open fracture of my leg that it, um, has developed an infection going in, debriding it, um, washing it out. Um, that would be an example of, of, of source control. That's important, so. Um, these are kind of the bedrock, kind of the foundation of dealing with these patients. Now, there is another term out there that is very much related to these terms that we've talked about. Um, it's just, it, really, it's just all, it's all just terminology. 
and, and nuance and terminology, but it's something referred to as MODS or multiple organ dysfunction syndrome. So this is multiple organ dysfunction syndrome. This, uh, at one point in time, uh, or sometimes is referred to as multi-system organ failure. Some people will call this multi-system organ failure. Um, MODS is kind of a technical term, multiple organ dysfunction syndrome. Um, actually came back, came about in the, uh, I believe it was like the mid 1970s. It's a relatively temporary term. And so essentially what multiple organ dysfunction syndrome is, it is a patient that has a failure of at least two organ systems. So MODS is highly related to severe sepsis and septic shock. In fact, it is very common for people in severe sepsis and or septic shock to also be in multiple organ dysfunction syndrome, right? Um, because severe sepsis is somebody who's septic with signs and symptoms of organ dysfunction. And if they have signs and symptoms of multiple organ dysfunction, then they are essentially in multiple organ dysfunction syndrome. And people in MODS tend to have a very high rate of morbidity and mortality. Um, like mortality rates can be over 50, 60, 70% of some of these patients. And they're at risk for a all sorts of other problems, right? They're high risk for developing kidney injuries, what we call an AKI or acute kidney injury because their kidneys aren't being perfused. And then that can progress to full-on renal failure. Um, let's see here. Uh, they're at high risk for having hematological complications. Um, specifically with clotting, anytime somebody develops a problem with blood clotting, that is something referred to as a coagulopathy, a coagulopathy, a clotting disorder. Um, and there is a specific kind of coagulopathy that can develop, and it's called DIC. That stands for disseminated intravascular. Coagula coagulation or coagulopathy, DIC. And essentially what happens with DIC is um, you actually trigger clotting. And so these patients start clotting. They start developing lots of clots all over their body, these, these little micro clots. And these clots can go into the brain, heart, lungs, knees, enteric circulation of the gut. Um, and they just start clotting and clotting and clotting and clotting, making all these little clots all over the place. And then what happens is they run out of clotting factors and they no longer have clotting factors. And then they start bleeding and they bleed and they bleed and they bleed and they bleed out from where their IV sites are. They bleed out from uh, nose, eyes, mucous membranes, um, the urinary catheters place. They'll start bleeding around that. Um, and they'll bleed and they'll bleed and they bleed. And so what, what happens is we give them clotting factors in blood products, and then they start clotting again. Um, and so then we try to give them things like heparin anticoagulants to prevent them from clotting, but that promotes bleeding. And it's this vicious cycle of uncontrolled clotting that leads to uncontrolled bleeding. And it's, it's, it's incredibly difficult to treat. And it is in Incredibly, it has a very high rate of mor morbidity and mortality. Very common in MODS, very common in, in severe sepsis and septic shock, and sometimes even in trauma. One of the worst cases of DIC I've ever seen in my career was a. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. MODS can the MODS can come on very, very rapidly. Yeah, um, because. Some of these organs, you know, are very sensitive to hypoperfusion, right? It, like your, your kidneys, your brain and your heart, they, they don't have to, they, they don't, the, the um, hypoperfusion doesn't have to last very long before they start shutting down.
Yeah. So yeah, this is something that can happen very rapidly. Sometimes it can take some time to develop. Um, and there's actually a another complication I'll mention that does take some time to develop. And uh, this is something that is referred to as ARDS. And that stands for acute respiratory distress syndrome. And this is when somebody has a lung injury, acute lung injury. Um, and that could be due to hypoperfusion of the lungs um, or it could be due to chemical injury, direct trauma. What happens is uh, this, uh, this takes um, usually a couple of days to develop. And so what can happen is you can like successfully resuscitate somebody from, from severe sepsis or septic shock or from a trauma. And then like within about 24 to 48 hours, what happens is they start developing pulmonary edema. Their, the amount of oxygen you have to give them goes up. They start having collapse of their alveoli. We need to give them PEEP and they need to be on a ventilator. And then they, they end up developing lung, lung failure and they have all this inflammation and all this damage of the lungs. And so you kind of have this delayed, it's kind of like a delayed onset injury, if you will. Um, and we, we, we see that with ARDS. So mods can have a very acute presentation, and then you can even have these delayed things that can occur you know, later on um, after a seemingly successful resuscitation. And this is where some people use the term irreversible shock. You uh, probably learned that as basics or, um, or in the intermediate or the advanced EMT course where um, you know, there's some inflection point where um, so much damage has been done, even if you are able to rapidly resuscitate that patient, the organs just cannot recover. And so you can see kind of a delayed onset of, of mods and, you know, DIC, ARDS, and some of these other things. Oh, no, pro no, no problem, Alex. Yeah, no, no problem at all. Yeah. No worries. All right. So any questions over all that stuff there? Is that that kind of makes sense. Everybody okay there? So you said it was acute respiratory what syndrome? Uh, distress, acute respiratory okay. distress syndrome. Yeah. Um, in fact, we see this um, in a lot of severe COVID-19 patients. A lot of uh, COVID-19 patients who end up dying are, are dying of ARDS. And, you know, with that, it, it, it generally takes weeks for these people like um, uh, with COVID-19, like most people don't get super sick in the first week, right? That's what we call the viral phase. It's really not until the second week where the immune system ramps up and you have an over-exaggerated immune response and that actually causes a lung injury. And so like the second and third week is where we see people really get super sick if they're going to get super sick, where the virus, the virus is really not even an issue anymore. They've dealt with the virus. They have antibodies. The viral load is either undetectable or very low, but their immune system is super ramped up and it's the immune system that is causing a problem. And in a lot of these cases with infections and even injuries, sometimes it's just the immune system just the, all the inflammation that's happening with the immune system and the vasodilation and the perfusion problems. And so it's actually the result of your own immune system um, um, that, that causes a lot, of the, the, uh, a lot of the damage as well. Well, it's 1030. Um, and I know I, uh, I went a little long on the first, um, first part of lecture. So I'll go a little short on this one. Let's go ahead and just take another break. Um, and I'll see you all back at 1045, uh, where we will talk. I want to spend so, a little bit of time talking about basic microbiology or infectious microbiology before I let you all go for the day. So I will see you all back at 940 or 1045, excuse me. Back everyone. I think we'll make this our final, final leg here uh, of, of lecture for today. Uh, so what I want to do now is I want to just talk a little bit about some of the things that can cause infection. And these things are collectively referred to as uh, pathogens. So let me go and share here. <clears throat> 
So, for terminology. So, a pathogen is an agent that causes diseases. All right. Uh, typically, these are microorganisms. A few examples. These include bacteria. Remember, bacteria are unicellular prokaryotic organisms. All right. There are fungi. These are yeasts and molds. Right. They can also cause some infections. There are some fungal infections out there. They aren't nearly as common, but they're around things like uh, down here, things like about fever, for example, is uh, thought to be caused by a kind of fungus. Candidiasis, oral candidiasis, or thrush vaginal candidiasis caused by candida albicans, which is one of the most common organisms, fungal organisms that cause uh, problems with yeast infections. There are, um, ah, there are parasites as well. And parasites are actually eukaryotic. And these include things like um, amoeba, like amoebic dysentery. Um, whoops, Let that go away. These include various kinds of worms. Right, round worms, flat worms, tapeworms, those kinds of things. And then, of course, viruses. All right, viruses are interesting. I'll talk about them in just a little bit of detail. So, a virus, in in many ways, is not really even an organism. Is it an organism? Is it living? Well, a virus doesn't do any metabolism. Remember when we talked about what cells do and we say that cells are kind of the fundamental unit of biology? Well, viruses don't do metabolism. So when you look at a virus, a virus is essentially some genetic material. So you've got some genetic material it can either be a strand of DNA or a strand of RNA, and it could be a single strand. And if it's just a single strand, then we call it single-stranded DNA, or it can be double-stranded, and we call that double-stranded DNA. Same thing with RNA, single-stranded RNA, double-stranded RNA. And then there are even further subdivisions talking about which strand, right? If it is the primary strand, right, um, we call that positive sense, right? So, like you might see a virus, and they'll they'll call it a you know a positive um, s RNA something like. That. That, that's positive sense, or if it's a complementary strand, that is, we say, is negative sense, right? So you essentially just have some genetic material, it could be DNA, it could be RNA, it could be double or single-stranded, positive or negative sense, and then that genetic material is surrounded or wrapped up in or protected in a capsule, a protein capsule, that's referred to as a capsid. All right. And typically there are some enzymes inside there as well. And those enzymes help typically help with the coding of that genetic material. Um, if this is a DNA virus, for example, it may need to contain reverse transcriptase so that DNA can get into the nucleus and get integrated with the, the genome. If it's an RNA virus, it may be some other enzyme like um, RNA dependent uh, uh, polymerase, like what you would see with, uh, with uh, SARS-CoV-2, for example, which is a positive sense single-stranded RNA virus. 
um, it uses a different enzyme because it's using a different nucleic acid, right? And the capsule or the capsid may or may not be surrounded by a plasma membrane. If it is surrounded by a plasma membrane, we say that it is an enveloped virus. Some viruses have an envelope and some viruses do not. Um, if it's just a capsule or just a capsid, there will be proteins on the surface of that. The proteins on the surface of that capsule or on the surface of the envelope, typically. And those proteins do a couple of things, but one of the most important things those proteins do is they act as little anchors. And a virus can't move on its own. It doesn't have mitochondria. It doesn't do metabolism inside. It's just genetic material and an enzyme in a protein capsule that may or may not have an envelope around it. And so essentially, I, I conceptualize a virus like an EpiPen, like an auto injector of epinephrine. The auto injector by itself isn't going to do anything, right? But that's kind of virus. It's this little auto injector of genetic material, and it's just going to float around. And if that virus happens to bump into the right kind of cell that has the right receptor that fits these proteins here, right? And it actually fits. There's a confirmation where they fit, and it allows that virus to attach and enter the cell. Then something can happen. Otherwise, viruses are just inert particles floating around, not doing anything, right? Um, and so when that virus happens to bump into the right kind of cell and attaches to that cell, then what happens is the virus fuses with the cell in its genetic material, the RNA and, the, and or DNA goes into the cell that it's attached to. And then these proteins or these enzymes will also go in and help that genetic material get integrated within the cellular machinery. If it's RNA, it might just need to go into the ribosomes and then the ribosomes convert the RNA in the virus, right? That RNA codes for production of new viruses. And so, or the DNA codes for the production of new viruses. And so when a virus gets into the cell, it turns the cell into a virus factory, so to speak. And then the vi new viruses start budding out of that cell and go to other cells and that cell may or may not die. And that's what we call a viral infection. So the virus by itself really isn't alive, but the virus infected cell is alive. So a virus is a weird thing, it is a weird pathogen that has two phases to its life cycle, a non-living phase, and then the virus infected cell, which is the living phase, all right? Um, so those are viruses. Um, what I want to do, however, is I want to spend just a little bit of time in the time that we have left today talking about bacteria. Um, viruses are super important. Everybody's talking about them with COVID and all that. Um, and we will talk about viruses in, in a little more detail, specifically like uh, um, we'll talk about uh, influenza and coronaviruses and uh, some of these other viruses. Uh, I think tomorrow I'm actually going to hit it a little bit. But today, what I want to do is I want to spend a little bit of time talking about bacteria. And more specifically, I want to talk about how can we think about some of the common bacteria that cause disease in human beings. So the way that we talk about bacteria is um, how we um, can identify them. And I'm going to talk a little bit about the terminology. Uh, associated with that. So we talk about bacterial organi organisms. The quickest, easiest thing that we can do is we can take a sample of that bacteria. And this typically is done through something called a CNS. A CNS. A CNS stands for a culture and sensitivity. So essentially, you take a culture of a, if, if, if you think the wound, if, if it's an infected wound, you take a wound culture. If it's 
If it's the urinary tract, you take a culture of the urine, a sample of the urine. If it's in the airway, you take a sample of the mucus. All right. Um, if it's the uh, gastrointestinal tract, you will typically also do a special kind of culture known as an O and P, and that stands for ova and parasite. So you will get a stool sample. And in addition to a culture and sensitivity, you will do an OMP. You'll look at it under the microscope and see if there are little um, parasites or ova or eggs for those parasites, because those tend to be a little larger, a little easier to identify. All right, so an OMP is a, is a kind of a specialized add-on to a culture and sensitivity or a CNS. But either way, we'll take a sample of that, run it to the lab, and the lab's gonna do a couple of things. The first thing the lab is going to do, and this is one of the, the most high yield tests we can do on somebody that has a suspected bacterial infection, and that is something called a gram stain. We can do what's called a gram stain. And a gram stain involves taking a sample of that, that bacteria and um, you you stain it, you essentially put crystal violet on it, and then you decolorize it with alcohol. And if the stain washes away for the most part, then that tells you something about that bacteria is what we call gram negative. It takes on like a pale pink color. But if the crystal violet stays, stains the bacteria and you look at it and has like a dark purple or violet color to it, then that is what we call a gram positive. And this has to do with the way the cell wall of the bacteria is constructed. In gram positive bacteria, there is a thick um, sugar-like substance. It is a, it, it, it is a, it is a uh, saccharide, a polymer saccharides, thick sugars, sugar-like substance called peptidoglycan. And gram-positive bacteria have a very thick layer of peptidoglycan, whereas the gram-negative bacteria tend to have a very thin layer of peptidoglycan, so it doesn't absorb as much of the stain. And this also means that the environments in which gram-positive and gram-negative bacteria live is, is, is a little different, all right? So, and you can do that within a few minutes. It only takes like five to 15 minutes to do a gram stain. You can get that information very quickly. The, that's um, called a gram stain. Now the culture and sensitivity, essentially what you do is you culture the bacteria and then you grow it and you grow a colony of that bacteria. And then you expose that bacteria to different antibiotics to figure out which antibiotic is best for that specific bacteria. That tends to take, that can take up to like 72 hours in some cases, you know, uh, uh, two to three days. So you can't get that information right away. So that's not as helpful in the short term where you have an acute, acutely ill patient and you're having to make decisions about, you know, antibiotics and things like that. Um, but the gram stain gives you that, at least that initial information to make some educated guesses about what the organism is and how to treat it. So I want to talk about some of the common gram positive bacteria. All right. And these really fall into what are known as the streptococci. And when it comes to bacteria, the way a bacteria is shaped will inform the name. So if bacteria look like little spheres, little spheres, we call those caucus, a caucus or cocci if you have lots of them, plural, right? So streptococci, means that you have spherical bacteria in strep means that the bacteria form chains and you can have little little two two bacteria at a time and that's what we call diplococci or you can have long chains of bacteria larger than two and we would just generally call those streptococci right strep streptococcal bacteria are very common in your upper airway. So these are common causes of ear, eyes, nose, and throat infections. Um, and these can migrate in your blood and they tend to go onto heart valves, right? And so these can cause something known as 
endocarditis or infective endocarditis, right? And this is common in patients who um, have had heart valves replaced um, where they're higher risk for this or people who are users or I use IV drugs, uh, methamphetamines, opioids, things like that, because streptococcal bacteria just live on your skin. Gram positive organisms are very good at living on, on the surface of your body um, and they can protect themselves real well. Um, and so if you're, you're shooting up a lot, um, you can introduce that bacteria into your bloodstream and then it'll go to your heart and colonize your heart valves and cause infective endocarditis um, and can cause dysfunction of, of heart valves. Um, it is a common cause of bacterial meningitis, which is the, the type of meningitis you do not want. It, it's a much more severe form of meningitis typically than say viral meningitis. Uh, certain kidney infections, glomerulonephritis can be caused by this, and certain pneumonias as well. Um, one of the most common streptococci that we run into is streptococci pneumoniae or strep pneumoniae. It's a very common organism that we run into. Now, if we see little spheres that form in clusters that kind of look like grape, like little grape-like cu clusters, that is known as staph. Staph is forming grape-like clusters. So staphylococci are spheres that form grape-like cu clusters. Staph is also commonly found on the skin. And so this is a very common cause of skin infections, wound infections, and some pneumonias. One of the most common is something called staphylococcus aureus or staph aureus. And aureus just means to form a golden color. The bacteria look kind of golden when we culture them. Um, these bacteria also have something called a super antigen. So what is an antigen? Well, we'll talk about it a little bit tomorrow, but a pathogen is an, is an organism, typically, not the case of a virus, but is, is an agent that can cause disease. An antigen is a specific component of a pathogen. It acts like a fingerprint that the immune system can use to identify that pathogen. That's what an antigen is. And some bacteria have, have what are called super antigens that can produce an exaggerated immune response. And that's where something called TSS or toxic shock syndrome can come from. This is a, it looks a lot like septic shock because it essentially is, right? These patients are very sick. Um, their blood pressure can get low and it's due to the immune system having an over-exaggerated response to this antigen in the bacteria and Staphylococcus aureus can do this um, and can cause this toxic shock syndrome. The other common example is Staphylococcus epidermidis, right? Um, and this can also cause endocarditis. And this is also a common cause of post-implant infections. Like if somebody has a catheter, like a Foley catheter or, a, or an invasive indwelling a vascular catheter, um, this can cause it. Um, and you also have Clostridium um, is a group of bacteria that can produce endospores that protect, protect themselves, and they're very anaerobic. Staph and strep tend to be aerobic. Um, they tend to like higher oxygen environments. That's why we see them in wounds and in your lungs, for in your heart, for example, where you have areas of the body where you have lots of oxygen. Clostridium, however, um, are spore forming, so they can wrap themselves in a spore and protect themselves, and they're anaerobic, so they prefer environments where there's not as much oxygen. And so Clostridium tetany, for example, um, which can cause tetanus, right? Um, Clostridium botulinum, which causes botulism. Clostridium difficile, or C. diff, in your gut, right, can cause uh, hard to treat um, diarrheal kinds of problems, right? Um, Clostridium uh, perfrigens, right, can cause gasking, green, certain kinds of fasciitis and food poisoning, right? 
Um, another example of a gram positive bacteria is something called Bacillus anthracis, AKA, this is the bacteria that causes the disease anthrax, can also form endospores, right? But staph and strep are super common. Um, now, when we talk about gram-negative bacteria, gram-negative bacteria are often rod-shaped. And whenever something is rod-shaped, so it is longer than it is wide, is, it has a rod or capsule-like shape to it, um, that is what's known as a bacillus or, a bacill, or bacilli if you're talking about multiple, right? So rod-shaped is a bacillus. Right now, um, you do have some gram positive bacilli examples as well, uh, Clostridium and Bacillus anthraxis. Um, but gram negative bacteria are often rods, and these include things like E. coli or Escherichia coli, Yersinia pestis, which can cause a plague, um, Klebsiella pneumonia. Pseudomonas aeruginosa, which can cause pseudomonas, uh, tends to be, uh, uh, pseudomonas can be um, uh, in the lungs or the gut, Proteus vulgaris, um, and Neisseria gonorrhea, which can cause gonorrhea. I included Proteus vulgaris um, mainly because uh, in if you take a, a microbiology class, one of the things you have to do in lab is you're given an unknown bacteria and then for several, for throughout like several weeks, you have to do all these different tests to figure out, figure out what, what, what is a bacteria? What's the gram stain? That's the first thing you do. Is it gram negative or gram positive? Oh, it's a gram negative. And then you do all these, you know, does it metabolize sugar? Or does it, you know, is it a TSI? Is it, uh, what does it do when you put it on blood uh, or McConkie agar? And you do all these tests and you figure out the exact organism that you're dealing with. And the one that I just happened to have I don't know why I remember this because it was like oh, it was like 25 years ago and I took took microbiology. It just happened to be Proteus vulgaris. Um, those those are some examples there. So you can see you can get a gram stain and it can give you at least a rough idea of some of the things you're dealing with. And so if you get like a gram negative um, in the urine, then you're you're thinking, okay, this is probably E. coli and you know, OH-157 is kind of the, the variant of E. coli that can cause uh, lots of problems with pathology. And there are certain antibiotics that are better for the gram-negative organisms. Or let's say that you cultured some sputum and it is, uh, uh, it is a gram-positive uh, sphere that is forming grape-like clusters. Well, then you know, okay, this is... Um, a, this is a staphylococcal infection, staphylococcus aureus. And then you go, well, did the patient get it in the hospital? So hospital acquired infection, or did they get it outside of the hospital? And okay, these are the antibiotics that are going to be the best bet for that or, or this, right? Uh, some other examples are mycobacteria. So these are examples of bacteria that do not stain, do not fall into the gram stain paradigm. The gram stain cannot be used uh, for them. Like mycobacteria, for example, um, stain differently. All right. And a mycobacteria actually stains something called an acid fast stain. So if you receive a report from somebody and you see that they have AFB positive, that stands for acid fast bacillus. Is mycobacteria are rods, then the thing you really want to worry about is tuberculosis or mycobacterium tuberculosis is the organism that causes tuberculosis. Um, these tend to be uh, aerobic. They like oxygen environments and they tend to, uh, they tend to grow very slowly though, right? Um, same thing with mycobacteria leprae, which can cause leprosy, all right? Then you have what are called mycoplasma, and they have no wall around the cell membrane. So some bacteria, they have their cell membrane, 
And then some bacteria can build a wall around the cell membrane, right? We talked about like the peptidoglycan and all that. Um, mycobacteria do not have that extra wall. They just have that cell membrane. Um, and these can, these can cause um, mycobacter mycoplasma pneumoniae, for example, can cause something called atypical pneumonia. Some people refer to this as quote unquote walking pneumonia. Uh, mycoplasma genitalium is a disease that can cause uh, sexually transmitted uh, that can cause something known as PID or pelvic inflammatory disease, which is a, uh, a potentially life-threatening and life-altering complication um, that we see mainly in biological women who um, get this. Gonorrhea can cause that as well. And then we also have what are called spirochetes. And spirochetes are, they, they are literally little spirally looking bacteria. They are double membranes, so they have a, two membranes. So, so some bacteria have a membrane and then a wall around the membrane. Some bacteria just have a membrane like the mycoplasma, and then some, some like the spirochetes actually have two plasma membranes. Um, and these include things like Borrelia burgdorferi, which causes Lyme disease, uh, Trepanoma pallidum, which causes syphilis, Leptospira, which can cause leptospirosis, all right? And then finally, I just want to spend a couple minutes talking about streptococcus, right? Strep versus staph. So these are the major differentiations of streptococcus, all right? So if we suspect, we think we're dealing with strep, one of the things that we do is we put that strep on blood auger. So you all have probably heard the term quote unquote Petri dish, right? Um, which is a bit of a misnomer because not all bacteria are gonna grow on Petri. Petri is a specific kind of nutrient and there are all sorts of different kinds of nutrients. You know, there is a uh, McConkie auger, there's blood auger, um, there's triple sugar iron stabs or TSI stabs, like there are all sorts of different media out there that we can try to grow bacteria on. Streptococcus just happens to grow great on blood. And this is one of the reasons why it can be such a problem when we have a severe strep infection. So what we do is we put that on auger instead of just Petri, it's actually auger with blood in it. And we, 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 we put the bacteria on that dish, that blood auger dish, and then we see what the bacteria does to that blood. And this, again, this takes, you know, uh, like a day or so to figure out. And it is what's known as hemolysis. How does the bacteria break the blood down? And we look for a pattern of hemolysis. If there is partial breakdown of the blood, that is what we call an alpha hemolytic strep. And we know that strep pneumoniae and strep viridans are the two major organisms that result in alpha hemolysis. Uh, we know that strep pneumoniae has a, can have a capsule. Um, this is also known as pneumococcus. And this causes like pneumonia, bacterial otitis, meningitis, sinusitis, whereas the, uh, the viridans, right, um, think of, uh, think of um, staphylococcus mutans, and the common thing is this causes the cavities of teeth, dental caries, right, and those cavities, if they go untreated, can get into the um, pulp and cause pulpitis, that can get into the root um, and penetrate into the uh, soft tissues of the jaw, and cause an abscess. And in severe cases, it can cause a life-threatening fasciitis of the soft tissues of the, of the, of the head and neck known as uh, Ludwig's angina, which is a life-threatening type of, um, of necrotizing fasciitis caused by uh, dental abscesses. Um, if, however, you have complete hemolysis, complete breakdown, the bacteria clears all the blood out of its path, 
Um, this is what we call beta hemolysis or beta hemolytic strep. Um, and the common types of strep that cause this are strep pyogenes. Pyogenes means to, uh, to cause pus. These are pus causing. And these are referred to as group A strep or GAS. So group A strep uh, tends to be strep pyogenes and it tends to cause beta hemolysis. And these are the common organisms that cause like strep throat where you get all that pus in the back of your throat, right? That's what's causing that. Um, these bacteria can also release toxins. These are called exotoxins. And these exotoxins can go and cause problems in other areas of the body. And these strep can colonize other areas of the body like your heart valves. And when that happens, this is called rheumatic fever. All right. Group B strep is another type of strep. Um, these can cause pneumonia meningitis, but this tends to be a problem with the very young and the very old. And so um, this is actually one of the things that we check for in, uh, say, prenatal workup. Uh, or if somebody becomes pregnant as part of their workup, um, prenatal workup and care is as we will... Um, we will actually do a culture and sensitivity of the vaginal mucosa, and we will look for the presence of streptococcus and look for its hemolytic pattern. And if, you know, if it, you know, like group B strep is present, we may opt to treat that mother um, for, that in, uh, for that bacteria. Even if she doesn't have an active infection, we still want to eliminate the bacteria because we know that that can be a problem for that newborn and that newborn can actually get that during delivery. All right. And then you also have uh, other types of strep that um, have no hemolysis or no hemolytic pattern at all. Um, and these are your various enterococcal species. We call those enterococcus. So enterococcus fecalis, enterococcus fecum. And these tend to cause like bladder prostate infections, infections of the epididymis. Sometimes they can cause endocarditis and infections and abscesses of the nervous system, like the brain abscess or a spinal um, abscess. All right. So any questions there over, um, over hemolysis patterns and strep? Anybody have any questions there? <clears throat> sure, I don't miss any messages here. Um, I should mention this is gamma. It's Greek for gamma. This is Greek alpha and beta. So gamma hemolysis would be no, no hemolysis. Okay. So that's just kind of a primer to, to so at least you better understand how these bacteria are identified. And when you hear them used in the clinical context, you can think, okay, yeah, I remember uh, strep pneumonia and, you know, it's common, you know, cause of pneumonia, meningitis, otitis, um, and so on. Um, so it just gives you a little, a little additional context. And when it comes to antibiotic therapy, it's really helpful to know this. Um, and typically what we do is we have very limited information when you first take care of that patient. And really all you can get is a gram stain or an acid fast stain, right? You do your stain and then based on the results of the stain, you can make an educated guess as to what kind of bacteria is involved. And then you will treat that patient with an antibiotic that has a broad level of activity for what you think the organism or organisms involved might be. And then within one to three days, as you get the culture back, right? And, and as the, um, the clinical lab scientists that are doing these cultures, you know, figure out, they do these tests, they figure out, okay, this is what we're dealing with, you know, this beta hemolysis, this is the exact organism. Then what happens is you tend to change the antibiotic the patient is on and you go from a broad spectrum to a narrow spectrum antibiotic to try to focus on um, the specific bacteria and what it is most sensitive to. Does that make sense? <clears throat>
Yes, sir. All right. Well, I think we've gone over plenty of uh, plenty of information today. So I'm going to go ahead and cut lecture off here. Um, and I actually have to um, get to lab over in Las Cruces because uh, I'm dealing with some students there. And I want to try to get ahead of the, the dust if I can so I can get over there. But I think we've covered plenty of information today. Uh, so that's all I've got for you all. I don't think there are any new assignments due today. So you don't have to worry about any of that. We'll just see you all tomorrow morning for the final lecture of the week. Thank, thank you, Chris. All. Yeah, thank you. You're very welcome. Yep, thanks a lot. Thanks, Chris. You're welcome. Thank you. Thanks, Chris. You're welcome.